But I think the main things is at the end of the day, volleyball is volleyball. It's in the same nine by nine court, and the rules are the same. So we. Uh, <laughs> Is that on the back of your shirt? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, yeah, yeah, it's on the back of your shirt. Dude, dude, a little free shout out for you. Um, and it doesn't matter who's on the other side of the net. You need to still execute to the best of your ability if you want a chance to win. That's right, Brett Walsh. And what is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to the 9x9. This is episode 115. It is April's first, but no April Fool's here. Um, it's honestly too late for that. We're all sick and tired of that. Rob's holding up his Purdue uh, shirt. His Boilermakers are going to the Final Four next weekend on the back of uh, Canada Zach Eady. So we're both celebrating. Um, and we are here to talk about fantastic week of volleyball. We have the Super Lake playoffs are going around for both the men and the women. The Plus Liga playoff race is coming down on the wire, and it is tight. Will Zaxa make it? We'll talk about that. Uh, of course, some crazy things going down in Turkey, as always. As the cup season was was upon us, and the playoffs get started off. So much stuff to talk about, Rob Sinclair. But first and foremost, how are you? Obviously, I'm, elated about oh Purdue. Oh my god! But yeah, that that was yesterday. Purdue going to the Final Four is one of my personal favorite sports moments of my life. Definitely oh. top five. Okay. Definitely top five sports moments of my life. I'm not that big. I'm not. I'm not the world's biggest basketball fan, but I am up there in the world's biggest Purdue fans. Uh, I spent five and a half years there. I'm really passionate about that school, and uh, they've five, been. Wait, wait. Took you five and a half years to graduate. Two degrees, my friend. Okay. Two oh. degrees. I thought before, I, thought I was going to have like a before that, but... before you clowned on me. Yeah, I, I got two degrees out of it. Uh, yeah, P Purdue basketball has been prone to serious heartbreak, and getting getting them to the Final Four was a great moment. So, yeah, shout out to Zach Eady from Toronto. Uh, yeah. Hope, yeah. Hope, hopefully, we win one because next Monday we are absolutely one, one not time. we are not doing a show next Monday. We're not. Uh, that's. It, assuming that Purdue wins on Saturday, Purdue will be playing in the national championship game next Monday night, and that is okay. So basically, if Purdue loses, <laughs> we're having a show on Monday, and if they right. win, we're not. Okay, correct. Yeah, All that's right. that's correct. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, I don't schedule. I get. I hopefully I don't get scheduled for next Tuesday. Yeah, we'll but, we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes. Anyway, right. uh, an another one of the, the the many sporting events that we watched this week. It was last Wednesday when yes. uh, when the Italian men's playoff quarterfinals, both game fives, both went down, and Everett, both the lower seated teams, both won the series. Monza beats Lube three to one to win the series in five. Milanzo, Milanzo, what was that? Milano beats yeah. Piacenza in no, a no three dong. Milano that three one. Dons Piacenza to advance as well. Obviously, let's start with Lube versus Monza. Uh, for Volley Canada, reasons. yes, of course, of course. I of do course. believe this is the first time that a Canadians have gone to the semifinals and I'm being in such a prominent role. Of course, Nick Hogue. Really? Played. Yeah, yeah Nick, with, Nick, Nick, Nick Hogue Perugia, for, yeah. for Perugia uh, a few years ago, but he was coming off the bench, right? Uh, whereas you can't deny that you know the Canadians are featured centrally uh, on, on that team. And Rob, in this one... It, it, it wasn't as tight uh, as the other ones. Lube wasn't able to keep up the level of play that we had seen from them previously. Zaitsev was a huge liability. In fact, they actually went away from him. Um, and the only set that they won was with Adis uh, out there. Um, but ultimately, Yant wasn't good enough. Nikolov wasn't good enough. Dicheka wasn't good enough. They just weren't per perfect enough. And I don't think Monza played a fantastic game anyway. And I think... Kachopa almost threw away that third set. They like basically oh. threw away that third set with some terrible decisions yeah. uh, offensively and some bad setting. Uh, but they were good enough to win. And that that was awesome. Like Lube just, they kind of came out flat. And you could tell that they were at the end of the rope of, of what they were able to do uh, in this series. That uh, that's an excellent summary for Lube right there. I mean, well, well, I think we, we got to talk more about Monza because they did win the series. But Lube being at the end of their rope of what they were capable of is is a really good description of what went on here. Uh, this was not the most competitive match. It, it was or it was it was competitive, but it wasn't the most high level match. Uh, it was it was a pretty awesome no. series though. This the series had a lot of back and forth twists and turns. Obviously, there was the huge Lube adjustment in sending Otis Legumja to the bench and going with the sort of three outside hitter thing with Zaitsev as like the passing opposite. 
But uh, like like you kind of alluded to, Monza won this fifth match on the road, and they won this series despite their setter Kachopa. They won yeah, this in spite so. of him. Uh, he was not good, and I and he was getting significantly outset by Luciano Dicecco. But uh, the man who I think deserves for sure the lion's share of credit is none other than Stephen Marr because he put that Monza team on his back. Yeah. And when it came down the stretch in that fourth set, when they needed to just grind away side outs and figure out how to score dumb, sloppy points, and the, the level of volleyball was kind of breaking apart at the seams for both teams, mm-hmm. the guy who got that match over the finish line was Steven Marr. And the six stuff blocks might be the most impressive part to me because that that was the, 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 the blocking adjustment that Monza made it took him two matches to do it, but the blocking adjustment that they made against the three outside hitter thing for Lube was the difference in the end to me. Yeah, very much so. I mean, Mar was the MVP of this that match, but also this series. Uh, I do think that Rand played outstanding. I mean, yeah, he, he did like 20, 20 points in, in this one. Like he was uh, 19 he was... on 16 kills, two blocks, and an ace. Okay. Fair enough. Volley, volley match, metrics has them at 20, so I mean, one point doesn't really matter. Um, but this one is, it wasn't the prettiest one by Monza, but they had a, a complete team performance. Even Lepke came in and it, like he was, what, five for six coming off, coming in off the bench. Uh, Schwartz was, was good with another 15. It was, it was a solid performance uh, from Monza. Um, they didn't get beat up nearly much as, as much in the middle. Um, and early on, like Lube's blocking was really on, like Lube's blocking in the first was, 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 was really on key, but the Monza was just able to steady things and ran being as good as he was in this game is really kind of what opened things up because it was open for Mars. It was open for Schwartz and yeah, they, it, it was a good, it was a good win for them. And, uh, that will be what the first time since like 2000 and like 2010, since we've had Lube in the champion league yeah it's crazy that we're gonna have a champions league next year that doesn't include lubich even and um i mean i we we all know my feelings on talking about like mid-season transfers or like transfers for next year while the season's still going on but uh both of these teams for next year are going to look significantly different both monza mm-hmm. and lube and monza the, the the least that monza can do right now even if they lose in the quarterfinal which i would predict that they absolutely will uh, they, they're going to play a third place series with a spot in the Champions League on the line. This Monza team is going to be completely different next year, so we'll we'll see how that goes. But uh, yeah, the, this is this is very much the end of an era for Lube Chivinanova. They have dominated uh, really all of Europe over the last decade, going on fifteen it's, years. They they've, they've, been, they've, they've been they've been a mainstay in Champions League. They've won. They've been a contender in literally every Scudetto. They've won several of them, even with teams that had no business doing so. Like last year is a good example. Yeah. But we know that John Lorenzo Blangini is not returning. Uh, we we suspect that a lot of their key pieces are headed elsewhere. It's the um, end of the Dicecco era. It's, that's, it, it does seem to be the end of the Dicecco era, and. Uh, it is just the end of an era in general of one of the great franchises in volleyball just uh, running out of rope. Like you said, they just they just didn't have they didn't have it this year. They they were the inferior team in this series, and they uh, they're not going to re- represent Italy in the Champions League next year. Yeah, crazy. Um, well, and it's it's kind of crazy that the fact that between Monza and Milano, like one of those teams will be playing Champions League. That is crazy. Right when 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 you think about it overall, but uh, moving over to this Milano game, Rob, I didn't see this one coming as much. This this result surprised me. I thought that this one was going to be a battle, um, and ultimately, one player one player kind of one player notably showed up for Piacenza, who doesn't notably show up. And the fact that Piacenza wasted this is a, the second good Yuri Romano game in this series that they've wasted, right? Correct. Those don't come in on. a row. I think those, yeah, those don't come have, happen very, very often. But still, just serve receive. Yeah, not good. They were they were they were just horrendous in reception. Yoandi lay all seven percent perfect. That's not good. Even Scott no. Farla was was not quite good enough at the. Uh, at passing at least the perfect the perfect passing rate was way down. Piacenza only blocked four balls. 
Um, two aces to 12 service errors is not even close to good enough. Those two aces only coming from Robert Landy Simone. And it is a good point. Kenny Diaper in the chat. Yuri Romano had a baby like the like the morning of this match. Like uh, him and his, um, I, I'm not sure, wife, fiance, girlfriend, whichever. Uh, they, they welcomed their first baby into the world literally the day of the match. And he was Piacenza's basically only productive player uh and everett i think you kind of nailed it on last week's show when you did a very hilarious impression of piacenza and all their players just kind of moping around and getting all angry and pissy and whiny and what we both agreed is that if milano sensed a little bit of that mopey pissy whininess they needed to pounce and step on piacenza's throats and i think that's that's exactly what they did that is exactly what what would happen and um i'm increasingly impressed by rare Rare. Come on, you can do it. <laughs> no, yeah, like, fair fairy rares, fairy rares. Jeez, Christ! Struggling Fifty percent efficiency. Fifty percent efficiency. Fifteen Jeez. for twenty-eight. Blocked once. No errors. Sixteen points total. By far the best player on the floor for either team. And as we have said throughout his ascension the last year or so, the kid is the truth. He's going to be yeah. so good, and he's still improving. And he fits this style of game, too. Like, mm-hmm. there's times when they're putting him in serve receive. Um, he had four digs in this match, right? Like, he makes plays. He's a volleyball player. So it's just just a treat to watch him. And he fits really well playing alongside Ishikawa uh, and Poro. And you've, you've just got a lot of, lot of good volleyball players uh, on that Milano team. So um, I think, like... One thing I, I will say right now, and I'm maybe jumping the gun on this a little slightly, and I think we're all expecting Perugia and Trentino to win the semifinal series, but I'm really looking forward to a potential Monza versus Milano uh, third place match. I, I think that could be really interesting because they were really good in this one. Um, Kaczynski is, he hasn't really been, last year we saw down the stretch in the playoffs, we saw him really like flower up. And when he wasn't there, Maguirejo was going to able to step up. And so far, that P2 spot for me for Milano has really been the biggest question mark, right? And, like, it, it just isn't producing. Luckily, they have Ishikawa, who has been magnificent, masterful. Yeah, he has, um, been, he has been brilliant. He was, inc- like, very, very good in this game. Um, but... That is one of their, their, their big questions for me uh, moving forward. On the Piacenza side of things, I just don't know. Like, it, it just comes down to, like, that team has all the skill in the world to win a Scudetto, right? If you told me, like, like if, like, two weeks ago you had told me, like, like you were someone from the future and you come in, like, oh, yeah, Piacenza wins a bit. Okay, cool. Like, that doesn't surprise me. But they also like you can tell that there's no care to the chemistry of the team and and, and how it works together, um, and I suspect that it's something further internal within the club. Like obviously I'm not there, and like like we have such a a weird perspective of it, like just watching it uh, on TV, and you know like we don't we're not even from the country, like it's, we don't even see most of it, but it just doesn't seem to work over there. Um, and I know one, once again, other than Trentino and Perugia. Everyone else is changing underneath. I know you hate talking about transfers, but the next upcoming year, the next year for everyone else except for those two teams are going to be so interesting. Yeah, completely different. And now what we know is not going to be different for Piacenza is that they extended Andrea Anastasi's contract. And for the life of me, I just simply cannot understand that decision. I simply cannot understand that decision. He... He has done nothing but disappoint with Piacenza except for capturing lightning in a bottle last year and winning the Italian Cup. That was the only positive thing that that he has done with this team. They are poorly constructed in terms of their just their the way that they mesh and that they do and they do have all the talent in the world, but uh, there are a lot of their their issues, especially the the mopiness and like the the how annoying they are to watch and their inability to get the most out of the talent they had, inclu- including Luke's point in the chat, that still two years in, Antoine Brizard can still not set Robert Lamy Simone the ball, which is insane to me. Like, stuff like that. And then they go ahead and, and extend Andrea Anastasi. 
I like I just don't understand what this franchise is doing. And now they're gonna like who knows what their goals are for next year because they won't be playing Champions League. They're gonna like waste away in this stupid fifth place playoff, which is another thing that I want to talk about about how stupid it is, uh, like a, a stupid thing that the Italian league does. But uh, I would just I would hate to be a Piacenza fan because they have the second highest budget in the league, maybe the second highest budget in all of volleyball potentially, at least outside of like a Russia. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but the 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 uh, the ability to do so little with so much they're the exact opposite of like a zaxa the last three years they're the exact opposite <coughs> of that in, um, in the in the worst possible way and i'm just i'm kind of happy to let the i'm, I'm kind of happy we don't have to watch them anymore because i'm i'm a little bit sick of just the way that they portray themselves even in these last two games, they were up 2-1 in the series. They were up 2-0 to zero in game four, got reverse swept, and then laid an egg at home and got three dong with the season on the line. No no heart. None. No heart. No, no, heart. no heart whatsoever. And that, that killed me. Uh, one note on that, Rob. Um, Anastasi was with Perugia last year. So he was oh, not was part Bernardi. of that. Oh, it was Bernardi. Oh, God. Yeah. Not for, part of forgive that. me for the two no, it wasn't even together. It wasn't even Bernardi. Bernardi was fired at Christmas last year. <laughs> uh, so so it was it was the other guy. Um, but uh, I forget. I, I forget what, what, what uh, we, were, we were just talking about. Um, Piacenza is a disappointment, and I'm happy for Milano because they're oh, going to. This, this, is, this is what I wanted to say. Let's hear it. You know, it. That it Honestly, I think it's bad for for volleyball that Piacenza isn't win, winning. And and listen to this because so far it's frustrating to me that teams with lower budgets are winning because that doesn't isn't forcing other teams to go out and make their higher budgets. If teams like Zaxa are winning and like the teams like who are like Piacenza who aren't spending a lot of money, like why would you go out and start start spending a lot of money? Why wouldn't you just like you would look to to change up your organization, obviously. But I want to see a team just throw a lot of money at something and start winning, and then everyone else have to raise up, raise up their budgets. But that's 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 a, a much a much bigger problem. Uh, I understand all, that. I, but, okay. I, but I, I see but what, I, think, I see where you're getting that there. But I don't think it it comes into why a team like Piacenza signs Anastasi. It's just because he's just like the best Italian guy on the market. How many Italian teams have a foreign coach? Um, I'm like I'm like asking Spiro? myself a series. Who? No, Stoichev, but he's Stoichev. been around. He's been around for so long. Yeah, I, mean, I, th- like, I think once that's again, actually he's just, it. Like, a, he's just like a guy who's been within the like the Super League ecosystem for so and long, and he's a massive, massive stooge. Obviously, so it, it, it just goes back to like my biggest gripe with the this the Super League and Italian volleyball in general is that there's nothing new under the sun. Like everything is, is just like, they just recycle the same old ideas, the same old ways of doing things, the same old coaches, like all of these same old things. And there's nothing changing. Whereas we're seeing things change uh, elsewhere, like in, in Poland and Japan and stuff. Sorry, this conversation has gotten way off course of, of what we were talking to. Uh, but that being said, Monza, Milano, moving on. Uh, yes, they are. The, the last thing I, we, we will talk about their first semifinal performances in a second. The last thing I wanted to complain about is this stupid fifth place playoff in Italy. Speaking of things that are just, they just do them, do this thing because they've done them in the past. This is such a colossal waste but it, of it's like for- three weeks of time. It's, it's a it's who a cares about waste. challenge cup nobody cares about challenge cup take the team that lost in the quarterfinals that finished the highest in the regular season and put them in challenge cup next year okay that's and that's how you should break the tie i don't that's I how don't, you should break the tie yeah, don't don't, like don't make these especially like a mode known verona and then who, who have been dead because they got swept in their quarterfinals and then the other teams like a pot of uh, like a chisterna they've been like chilling they all went to like the middle east to play for two weeks and then they have to come back and play three weeks of absolutely meaningless volleyball. Get rid of all of that. It, none of those yeah, games no make any money that. anyway. Nobody watches them and nobody goes to the game. So there's no point. Yeah. Give the players and that that month off that you could be giving the players would be enormously important for them. It Massive. would be so massively important for those players. Well, especially, especially that we're hearing that like Simone wanted to be released from Piacenza to go get ready for the national team season. They're like, you have Romeo Alonso, ride him. And Biachenza was like, no, we, we, we don't want you that. You've, you've, you've like given everything for us. You've been our most consistent and our best player on the regular basis all year for two years now. 
No. We we want you to uh, to stay to help us go get fifth place. Oh yeah, we have a world class middle right behind you. He could start <laughs> for almost any other team in the league. But no, 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 don't, don't. We need you. Awful. It's it's awful, 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 awful. The, get rid of the fifth place playoff. Get rid of it entirely. This is how many how many freaking matches is this? It's like twelve meaningless matches. Yeah. So no, fifteen meaningless matches. What are we doing per team or in general? It, total. It's fifteen okay. meaningless matches total. Garbage. Garbage. That and, and that that's just like this sort of round robin that they play. Because then I think there's like a little mini playoff for fifth place after that. It's so pointless. Get rid of it. It yeah. may, all all I guarantee you that that segment loses everybody money. Everyone. Every get rid of it. Players included. Get rid of it. Players included. Yeah. Anyway, on to volleyball in Italy that is meaningful because the semifinals are underway. Uh we had leg one on Sunday in both of these semifinal series. Uh pretty predictably Trentino three dong Modna or Monza, excuse me. Uh, Monza had a very legitimate chance in the first. They let it slip away. They lost it in overtime. And uh, that was kind of it. Yeah. I mean, there was, they were just kind of floating. Trentino was rocking. Lepke came out. Well, I mean, we need to talk about first and foremost. Yeah, Stephen Marr wasn't on the roster. Yeah. Do we, we, do you know what happened there? I heard it might have been a head injury. Yeah. So it sounds like he got hit in the head uh, in practice and he was immediately shut down. Um, and there was, there's, there's been no mention of it since. So obviously we send uh, Mar our best um, head injuries are always interesting. Scary, always yep. So we'll, we'll, we'll have to monitor that. Um, and luckily for, for Monza, you have Eric Lepke who can cut off the bench and, and kind of, be great and that's exactly what he was was. was. like efl was the best player on the court maybe maybe micheletto but he was in the best player on the court uh, hands down for for monza but where monza really broke down was the serve receive well there was there was two things that broke down because when you look at the numbers in this rob they were pretty they they weren't they were pretty close in everything except for aces yeah they're nine nine to one is an absolute difference and that's exactly what happened in in that uh in the in that first set, Monza went up 24-22. Lavia went back and just absolutely brushed them and served a couple straight aces, you know, like two straight aces to, to finish them off. Yeah, uh, and everyone Gugini. was clowning on Gagini for getting beat down the line on that last one. I don't blame him at all. That serve was literally untouchable. That was he that was, was he, a- it was a he, uh, it, yes, he was too far inside the sideline, but I'm sure that was like scouting feedback to take away Lavia's prominent serve because they beat him in the five six seam, the serve before that. And then he just painted the zone one sideline with an absolute beauty of a world class serve. I don't think that's anybody's fault. I just think Lavia is the man because he is. Yeah, and when, I mean, they, when you they, lose that set that way, that that's without your best player, and that that's difficult to come back from, especially when Arthur Schwartz hits negative. That that was the the next big thing is that Arthur did not have a game good no. game and he has these stinkers sometimes and um it, he just wasn't there. Um, Milano as an entirety just came out flat. Um, Monza as an entirety, yeah, sorry. and they, they did Monza Monza as, as an entirety like this this one you can't even break down much. Um, I thought Mujanovic when he came off the bench. He did a pretty good job. He brought some energy, and he was just aggressive. Like he's just a big, big, big body out there swimming at some balls. So it's it worked out for them. Monza really has to bounce back. I don't know if they're going to be able to handle Trentino's surfing, right? Especially without Stephen Mar out there, because that's that's like one the the one trade off when you put out Lefty. I think Lefty's offensive output is better than Mars, but Mars passing is just an inch like is oh, it's it's substantially better it's, like yeah I, i'm not going to say just a little bit better it's quite a bit better than lepke's but he also has the ability to fight off serves right where some where other people might get aced um lep or mar would just have the ability to keep the ball fight alive. it off like keep, yeah. keep the ball alive make a one pass a two pass you know f- f- further and foremost but to me like i need ran takahashi to be an elite player in a game like this. He was just very average out there. His passing was pretty good. Like he passed a, a, a 2.13. So that's that's pretty decent. He was hands down the best passer. But he only made one dig on the afternoon. 
right? Mm, yeah. If I'm Ran Takahashi and I'm only I'm only I've only got a 30% efficiency and I've only scoring 10 points in 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 four sets, I need you to go out there, put some pressure on your serve and make some effing digs because he was he was an afterthought for that Monza team the entire yeah, he was, time. He was a non-factor, but I, I, like honestly, I'll give it to him. They they won a, a long five match series like three days before they went on the road to Trentino. They get three donged, whatever. Like I, I'm uh, my my the indicator for me for Monza will be how do they respond this week, yeah. and we will see because Trentino is better than them. And uh, with if we'll have to see if Stephen Mar is able to play as well because somebody's making a point about. Moans's opposite situation. They did have Ibrahim Lawani earlier in the season. And you got to remember, like when if Mar and Ran are the outsides, Eric Lepke is the backup opposite. <laughs> like he he will come in on the right side yeah. ahead of Nick Mujanovic. So uh they're down to like their fourth guy when when Schwartz was bad in this match. No big deal though. Uh everybody expected Trentino to win this game. We'll see what happens in game two. Perugia Milano was much more competitive. Yeah. Uh, at least Milano was able to take a set. They um, just pushed it over the finish line in the third, down two to zero. But uh, the storyline here is just how good Wasim Bentara was. My goodness, <laughs> he was so sick, and he torched an ace down the line to win the match. One of four aces on the game, he went eighteen for twenty nine, dropping twenty two points total, which was by far the most in the match, and was by far the best player for either team because. Even Camille Semenyuk wasn't all that good for Perugia. And we saw Wilfredo Leon as full-time outside hitter and there in that fourth set, which was I also mean, interesting. Like, yeah, Semenyuk wasn't great. He had like a 250 his efficiency. passing was horrendous, which is oh, unlike yeah. him. Yeah, he passed. his passing was terrible. He passed a 1.19, um, which was... Uh, which is really bad. It's bad. That 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 is absolutely That's terrible. Bad. But other than then Semenya, the rest of Perugia was rock solid. Yeah. Plotnitsky does what Plotnitsky do. Kept on marching forward. As you said, Bentara was absolutely outstanding. Uh Flavio went down in this one um and got injured, I think, in the fourth set. Did he come back on though? Um, I don't remember. Yeah. So but they, was, but I mean, then when when your when your backup middle is Sebastian Solé, like, yeah, come on, Bruges is fine. Uh, yeah, no worries there. Uh, I was I was blown away by how good Bentara played. I, I I've been trying to tell y'all uh, the you can absolutely <coughs> you can absolutely win a championship with this man, and I uh, I was I was just blown away by how well he played uh, his range. I, I do want to see him hit the ball down the line a little bit more, but uh, my goodness, his serving his serving was really something special i do also want to give a lot of credit to gianelli and the way he's running this offense right now um rob if or any of you i have this if you have the ability to like watch it from a volumetrics like scout baseline view his distribution of the ball is fantastic like he is he is setting very well he's setting very methodically i mean gianelli has always been a very cerebral setter I think that he understands the game at a very high level. And when he's able to keep his emotions in check and when he's able to stay, stay even, that's when he's at his best. And that's exactly what we saw in, in this one. And if Giannelli can find a way to bring energy to his team and still be that linchpin that he needs to be for both Perugia and, and Italy, but keep his emotions a little bit more even like a Micheletto type, like, Oh, he he could really continue to blossom as, as as being one of the big ones. But you know, even despite uh Semenyuk, who has arguably been their best player all year long, not having his game, it didn't affect the rest, rest of the team where throughout the entire match it just felt more like Milano was was scrambling just to keep up. Yeah, and and it's not like even Milano was statistically bad in any category no. other than other than getting ace 13 or making 13 reception errors uh yeah nine aces 21 service errors for perugia but 13 reception errors for milano according to this stat sheet so uh they're getting served off the court their offensive numbers were okay and yeah piazza's doing some some pretty interesting stuff with their reception pattern like in rotation five or at least how how we in the states call it rotation five when Loser is on the right sideline he actually drops back to position one and passes and serve receive as part of a yeah. four man, which is crazy to have he a passed, he passed pretty good. 
Yeah, they, he passed they, okay. He, he got uh, somebody's. He passed a two point one four. Dude, that's a middle. <laughs> that's yeah. pretty awesome. He and was, there was one he, in the Piacenza series where he he was over there. He he got served. He passed a nail, and then he got up and and ripped a quick for for a point, which like he might be the only middle on the planet who can do that. But uh, yeah, uh, reception is going to be the the key area for Milano if they're going to have any chance at all in this series. Perugia serving is just on another level. They are they are built to be potentially the scariest serving team on planet Earth. Um, even like even you bring in Soleil, that float serve is a sick mix up. I really like Roberto Russo's hybrid serve a lot. That thing is nasty. It moves real weird. He contacts it high. Uh, and then you have whatever three wings, one of which might be Wilfredo Leon, who's the best server of the ball probably of all time. And uh, th- th- that's going to be number concern number one, two, and three for Roberto Piazza is how does he stop his team from giving up so many ace serves? So uh we'll see what happens obviously serving is volatile Perugia's is not going to be that good every game but uh getting close to double digit aces and in, in four sets is exactly what they're looking for yeah absolutely another thing milano need milano needs to be better in first ball side out right now they're digging more balls than than perugia that's um, not surprising but it's just like once again like as i said like they're really scrambly like perugia is siding out like first ball side out close to 45 percent, whereas milano is under like like 38 percent right so that first wow ball, that's yeah, low yeah that that first ball side out right now for perugia is is really really good and while milano is making is is making more defensive plays they're not making as many digs uh or that many more digs. so they need to figure out that, that first ball side out and to me it's it's once again that p2 position like kaczynski has to be uh, a little bit better. And also, like, Ishikawa has, like, they just need to be better as a team, I think. Yep. Yeah, they just got to be better as a team. So let's see, what time are are these games this week? Uh, The the, the 3.30 Wednesday games. Of course they are. Yeah, of course they are. Same time. Ridiculous. I mean, I, I love, I love, I don't love the timing of it, but I love these Wednesday games. So. Yo, Wednesday games are awesome. I'm all about yeah. that. I just wish they weren't at the exact same hour. Uh, all right, that's uh, that's enough for the Italian men. We'll, we'll certainly dig into this uh, these quarterfinal series on next week or semifinals on next week's show. Hopefully, they're not both over by next week's show. I want to see, but uh, they go at least four. Uh, honestly, it could be. It could be. I mean, if you're Perugia right now, like beating Milano is one of your biggest demons 100 percent. we and all know what happened last year not only last year but the end of the season too like you know maybe that one isn't isn't as isn't as, as much but still like perugia needs needs to, to make a point here um and trentino too i could see realistically in my opinion i think i think monza if they want any chance whatsoever they need to win game two Yep. They absolutely need to win game two. Yep, no um, question. They're at home. Yeah. You can't go down 0-2 in a series with Trentino. There's no. literally, literally no way that Trentino loses a series when they're up 2-0. to And yeah. uh, and everybody knows that as well, including Monza. So uh, I, I think... Yeah, I mean, there a, could be an injury. Like, let's not let's not sit here and say there's literally no way. Like, well, weird <laughs> things have happened. However, I will say that if Perugia goes up 2 nothing. They need to win it in three. They need to win it in three. Don't let that door open because there's something about this Milano team. And and I think Paul Piazza is the perfect type of coach. And it's crazy how we just love Piazza because he gives us good interviews now, but that's, (laughs) that's what we're willing to go with. Um, Piazza is actually the right type of coach that like when their backs are against the wall and they're the underdogs to really put the fire on their ass. So like if Milano starts to believe that's when things could get tricky, right? And that's where all of a sudden, all of that pressure, everything from last year, not being in Champions League, all of the talk, all of that comes right back. There's not a lot of that noise right now for, for Perugia because they're really just cruising. But if Milano even just takes one, if, if they're able to take one of these matches, all of that opens up. Well said. And I think you're absolutely right. Uh, yeah, both, both lower seeds, both go home on Wednesday. We'll see if they can defend home court. All right. Uh, on to the women's playoffs in Italy. Uh, these all of these series were incredibly predictable. Um, Imoco and Corneliano destroyed Roma two to zero. They advance. Scandici destroyed Valafolia two zero. They advance. Malonza figured out how to get past Pinarola without Alessia Oro setting. 
Uh, that first match was a five setter. It was very sloppy. It was a little bit painful to watch, but they figured it out. And then, of course, also pretty predictably, uh, the four versus five series of Kiari and Novara are deadlocked at one. So that is the the series that we were hoping it would be. It's definitely worth watching. Uh, that game three is Wednesday as well, the same time as the two men's games, which is really annoying. But um, yeah, this is shaking out exactly how we thought. I'm my my biggest question is is Alessia Oro going to be able to play versus Scandici in the semifinals because these semifinals are are still only best of three match series. It's it's just her ankle, right? Yeah, yeah, but like it was. I think the, the, the more time has gone on, the more insane that it actually was that Alessia Oro played that Fenerbahce Champions League series like three or four days after hurting her ankle. The fact that she was able to play that that match and win that golden set is insane because so, ever since then, every time I've seen her in all the broadcasts and all the, like the um, Vero Volley's social media and that stuff, her ankle is taped and she's on crutches. Like whatever they did to her for that one match was like a, a heroic effort by their strength and conditioning and athletic training staff. Heroic effort. That's a big needle. That's, that's so, what that is. We'll, yeah. we'll, we'll leave um, it at that. But if anyone in the chat knows what's the latest with Alessia Oro, please let us know. I do think, though, that in an, in an event that they needed her to play right now, she could. Right? And to me, this is maybe just out of an abundance of caution. You know, it's like, look, we're playing we're playing Pinarolo. It really doesn't matter. Let's 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 just let the backup get some chances, and and I mean like they've settled things down, right? So it just gives her some time to. And everyone in if you've played volleyball, you've had an ankle injury. Oh right? sure, yeah. It's and if, very if you common. haven't had an ankle injury, you're a poser. Um, <laughs> but, or you or or you play libero. We can we can give him a break there. No, yeah, even, we, ankle, even liberos get ankle injuries. We've well, uh, yeah, we've we've all played through ankle injuries. Like it, yeah. it, it, it totally happens. But like and, I, and, I was, I watched the end of uh, match one in that Malonza versus Pinarolo series, like the one that went five, and yeah. that was like watching Vittoria Prandi try and set that team was rough. It yeah. was, it, it was rough. It but was it settled down. Good. It settled down in game two, right? And yeah, and it got that, a little better in game two. It, it it got a little bit better. And and to me, that's just the nerves, right? Because, like, this is someone who's been there and has been has working with them all, all year, and you just get onto that stage, and, 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 and it's just the nerves. But they're up 2 nothing, and, and that's really all that matters. Um, so uh, who's your pick, Kiari versus Novara? I think I know the answer. Uh, right now, with the way that Marina Markova is playing, it's really hard to to look away from Novara. Because like like we said at the Nova is a baller. She's so good. Yes. But like we said, like at the beginning of the series that or at the beginning or earlier in the year that Kerry might have a better team, but Novara has Akamova. And they went like like Akamova was bad in this one and they subbed her off right away for Markova. Yeah, and Markova, Markova playing, playing over. opposite. But yeah, Markova got injured in the in the first game, right? And and they took her off. And I think that's one of the reasons what led to Kieri winning g- game one. Um, and I mean, it makes sense. Markova is just such an offensive threat. So putting her on the right side, sure, why not? Just like let her go. And she balled she out. She was right? insane in game 20, two. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 37, two that's blocks. Crazy. In a three-set yeah. match, 22 in a three-set match when she didn't even start especially in a women's game like that that's yeah. that's spectacular yeah and for me it's the the middle situation for for um Carrie was one that I thought was so good and they just kind of can't find like they key need to keep Anna Gray in there and ultimately they would need both Zaykachu and Camila Weitzel like both of those players have such an iPad impact. Like they're all three of them are good, but there's just some limits to the carry offense when Omarui isn't playing good. And yeah, it's a it's a foreigner limit problem for sure. Yeah, because Omarui. Because Omarui, when like when they started turning things around the regular season, Omarui was really rolling and and really fitting into that P two position really well. Um, but it it, it just hasn't really hap- happened for them. Um. And then they are much better though when Weitzel and Zakeo can be the middles. 
yeah. they're they're much 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 better. But if if Omaru is going to be bad and they have to play um, the two American left sides, uh, Maddie Kingdon and uh, Avery Skinner, if they have to do that. Then they then they have to bench one of their better middles. It's kind of the same problem that Lubitsch Ivanova had in the playoffs. So yeah, we'll see what happens. Uh, I will have this game along with the other two games on Wednesday. And uh, yeah. I'm excited to see what happens because uh, a lot on the line, obviously, with still the opportunity to go to the Champions League. Because, like, neither yeah. of these, let's be serious, neither of these teams is beating Canaliano. And everyone knows that. No. So, it's, yeah. That, the other, that, yeah. That be the other, that other semifinal is going to be. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that other one, Scandici Malone's, like, that, <laughs> that, that's going to be fun. But, like, whoever wins this series, the 4 5 series, their goal is to win the third place series and go to the Champions League. Yeah. Because they're, I mean, not, they're not beating Canaliano. It's not happening. As, as much as I like this middle core for Kieri, they don't have a player at the level of Ana Danesi. And she oh, was yeah. really good in this one. Offensively, man, five for ten, but she also had five blocks. Yeah. Um, for 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 eleven points. Danesi is a national team starter. Like she is rock solid. Yeah, absolutely. So there's I really like Kieri, and I love the fact that they were able to win what it was the challenge cup. CEV Cup this year, CEV Challenge Cup, Cup last yeah. year, CEV Cup. But I don't know if I I'll, I'll see it. But you know what? We'll we'll have three screens up on uh, on Wednesday, and we'll watch we'll watch it all at the same time. Yes, we will. All right, we'll let's move all. on. Let's move on. Well, actually, before we move on, I think we should tell people about a couple important things before we talk about the Turkish league. Don't worry, Turkish people, we will. We're going to talk about your leagues, but first, we're going to talk about that volleyball store dot com. Yeah, we don't want to make our Turkish fans angry. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Head over to that volleyball. That's almost good perfect. catch. Good yeah. catch. Caught myself. <laughs> Old habits die hard. Uh, that volleyball that. store. <laughs> dot com. Use the code spicy for a off your uh, entire order. Pulled out an old school one. Oh, yeah. That's wow. that's a good one. Yeah, the base, baseball tee with the spicy Come volleyball team. logo. I, uh, I, I took a lot of heat last year, Rob, from our general fan base around vnl time um mostly about my size um Ooh, i think that might be uh the vo- the voice of ronnie cuban spike oh no it was pretty like i still remember like like v- looking at one of the first interviews i did before you got there and looking at myself being like oh i look fat <laughs> and then posting it a bunch of stuff and there's just all these people in the discord be like ever looks really fat <laughs> That sucks. Uh, so I'm I'm happy to say that I went down a belt loop this morning. So, hey, um, well done. Yeah, I, Good work. I might have to go go over to that volleyball dot store, volleyball store dot com, Dan, um, and pick myself up some new stuff because uh, I'm a little, I'm a little skinnier than last year. Suck it, run. At a boy. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. Well, you you know what makes you look real real good, uh, no matter what size you are. That would Daddy. be something from the Where's Daddy collection because Daddy Stankovic. If you can have any similarities to him, uh, then, then you're doing all right. So uh, Daddy, of course, is part of our favorite segment where we hide him somewhere in the show. And you guys got to try and find out where he's at and comment the timestamp when you find him. It's always a fun little game. It's my favorite part of my week, trying to Photoshop Daddy Stankovic somewhere. Last week, we were talking about the Fenerbahce women, women winning the Turkish Cup. And you see Daddy there on the left above Magdalena Stisiak, slightly obscured by a volleyball. But there he is. There he is. I, I tried to color match him because they, man, all, all the ladies in this photo look unusually gold. So I had to had to add some gold color to Daddy's face and hide him behind the volleyball. But uh, yeah, this was uh, this was a fun one. Uh, several of you found him. Uh, Anthony Lee says, "Congrats, Daddy, on winning with Lavarini coaching." So nice. Uh, good job, Anthony Lee. You found Daddy first. Uh, make sure you keep an eye out for Daddy and uh, pick up a time the timestamp of wherever he is. Save that timestamp. Wait until after the stream is over and comment in the main YouTube comment section afterwards, and you'll get a shout out next week. Ever, you just got a compliment on your haircut in the chat. Haircut. I need a haircut. <laughs> At least it's it's, a, just... it's not the man bun anymore, and I think we're all probably better for it. Well, trust me. You're like, I was actually thinking about that. I went back on a picture and saw myself with the long hair, and I was just like, "Ooh, that was a that was a, a time, eh?" Like, I mean, we see like, it at the beginning of every show in the Brett Walsh video. That is just we need. There's so <laughs> nope, many things never I gonna happen about that 
friggin' video. We need to get rid of it. Like it, nope. it is the app absolute worst. It's not going anywhere. There's no way that that would ever that <laughs> nine by nine would ever come up that organically ever again. We can't retire it unless somebody does an interview and like intentionally weaves it in there to try and replace Brett Walsh. But uh, I'm I'm never getting rid of it, and I produce the show, so there. <laughs> We we'll, we'll we'll talk about this one. So uh, because, because yeah, because, mm, I don't all know. right. There's, there's there's some time things I want to forget about that. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, let 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 us move on uh, away from Italy. First and foremost, Hulk Bank over the weekend winning the Turkish Cup. Um, they win three one over Arcus Izmir in the final. Um, they took down Fenerbahce three one in the semifinals, and Arcus upset. Zero at bank, three two in five uh, in the other semifinal. Um, yeah, that was hype. That I mean, that that Arcus Arcus beating Zero was definitely the story. Uh, that that was an awesome match. But the the final was really good too. I think this was last last Wednesday ish, maybe last Thursday. I can't remember, but I had a really good time watching this. This is a super tight game. Every set was two points. A uh, Hulk Bank won the final three to one. Um, F.A. Mandaraja did his best. He had 22 points on 19 for 32 attacking, which is sick. That's spot spectacular. Uh, Grozer, pretty good. Uh, Burutai Subasha, also very good. Uh, it was not enough because of a 30 bomb dropped by Namir Abdelaziz. 27 for 38 with a block and two aces. Dude, he hit seventy one percent, and his crazy. efficiency his efficiency is sky is well over. 60%. Where has he been in in international competition? And in, within Turkish borders, he has been the best Phenomenal. player in the league, and it has not been close. Why couldn't he have done at least a little bit of that in Champions League? Crazy, or you know, World Club Championship or right, anything right. like that. Like it has been shaky for them internationally, um, but so far, I mean. Zero Bank losing to Arcus, and I mean Arcus is a sixth place team this year, um, in in the uh, in the league. Like since since the the teams with the cup have been decided, Arcus has dropped down to sixth. But they did a really good this weekend in the cup was to me a classic Glenn Hogue masterclass where you're going to be able to stay with a team and ultimately they were able to make athletic plays down the stretch. And like when you have a guy like Gregor Grozier, athletic plays are always possible, right? Like making a play that doesn't just fit the norm, like is, is always possible uh, Greg, with Gregor Grozier. But how about Nick Ho coming in to finish off that? What uh, a that plus set. piece of serving in that semi, man. Yeah. Lube, Lube fans are having haunting memories from, Nick, <laughs> from that Eagle Ho time coming in off the bench when he first went bald. <laughs> We're just sniping them with Perugia. Um, yeah, it was it was it was a really good one. Unfortunately, they they weren't able to do it in the finals. Uh, Dude, that final was a good match. I that thought was, I thought it was going to be a bit of a like a shit kicking. Like I thought, yeah, I, I thought I was it was pleasantly gonna be a, surprised. Yeah, Arcus was was really really good. I mean, hey, if that's a sixth place team in the Efrile League, that's a that's a really good team. Yeah, and then F.A. Mandaraja, just for those of you who haven't watched this kid that much, he is an absolute star. F.A. Mandaraja is a star. And you know who he, he was? He was supposed to, like, he started this season with Arcus, right? Yeah, That's, so you're, yeah. you're thinking of Mirza Lagumja, oh, no, who started Mirza with Lagumja. Arcus and then, and then got yeah. poached. Uh, by Hulk Bank, but F.A. Mandaraja was was in the was in Arcus's plans the whole time. Hasn't been healthy for like two full years. But I mean, him him and Grozer combined for fifty points in the semifinal against Zirat. Twenty six for Grozer, twenty four for Mandaraja. Like it's 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 nuts. So uh, yeah, like that that Turkish outside hitter crew, like Mandaraja, Mirza Lagumja, F.A. Byram, and like whoever their fourth wants to be, like that. <laughs> Seems going to be pretty good in a couple years. Yeah, Mandaraja is a stud. I love watching him. He's insanely dynamic. He needs to figure out how to pass the ball, though. But yeah, good for Arcus. That was fun to watch. Uh, that final was very fun to watch. Seriously, that, that was that was an outstanding match. Hulk Bank really had to earn it, but uh, they're the best team in Turkey. And now they start the semifinals in the FLR League, I think, this week. I think Wednesday. Yeah, yeah they do. Sorry, uh, tomorrow, uh, Tuesday. <coughs> yeah, because we can talk about the women's. Um, yep. 
we'll first and foremost talk about the end of the regular season with Fenerbahce uh, taking the last match, clinching the number one seed over Exacha Basha without Melissa Vargas. Key uh, key statement there, without Melissa Vargas. So yeah, this is a postponement from, from match day 15, which was forever ago, and it was before Melissa Vargas came back from China to play for Fenerbahce, so she was ineligible to play. Uh, but as you do see there in your photo, Ada Erdem was back. And that made a big difference, at least to me watching. Uh, so Magdalena Sisiak had to shoulder the load and uh, and was very good, I thought. I'm trying to f- uh, scroll all the way back and find and find the stats of this game. Um, the, the key thing to watching this, this went back and forth. It was uh, as se- it's seemingly a lot of its Basha games kind of go. They're really good for a set, and then they're pretty rough for a set. Um, and unfortunately for Zajabasha, with a lot on the line, because this match literally determined who was going to be the number one seed in the Swedenmar League playoffs, they the beginning of that that fifth set was one of the most shocking things I've ever watched. Fenerbahce went up seven to zero, seven to zero, in a fifth set with errors wow. and getting blocked and getting aced, and it, it was just painful to watch. And uh, and then and then that was the match. It was it was a good match to end the season. It was definitely dramatic, but like the, that fifth set start, starting off seven to nothing was 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 a was a killer. Obviously, and once again, Boscovich, thirty four points. Sheesh, five aces. And yeah, that was the best I've seen her serve in a while. It was good to see her like start getting in a little bit of a groove, jump spin serving. So uh, watch out for that in the playoffs for sure. Uh, well, speaking of the playoffs, they literally game ones uh, went down today, um, but both those teams, Fenerbahce was three nothing over uh, Thy um, and Exasha Basha three one over Vakov Bank. Set number one was twenty five eleven for Exasha Basha. Yeah, it was rough. That was, uh, and then set four was twenty five fifteen. Like Vakov was, yeah. I, I, I turned this on about halfway through, so I missed the, I missed the twenty five eleven. And uh, fortunately, too, because that was uh, that was horrendous, obviously. But um, yeah, Boscovich, eighteen for thirty-two, only three errors, like sky high efficiency. Hande Baladin was good. Irina Voronkova was very good. Uh, so that was nice to see. If you're an Zajabasha fan, their outside hitters produced at a pretty high level. But then, like on the Vakif Bank side, uh, yeah, not Rob, good. Real, real question. Yeah. How- let's hear. Are you worried about Jordan Thompson's performance very, this year very, leading into the summer? Because very that worried. to me is whenever I watch Vakov Bank, it's crazy how the mighty have fallen, right? And they just seem disorganized. They seem disinterested. They just seem to can't can't figure it out. Like really, like like to me, Guidetti, like you still have world class talent on this team. Right, and everything is just falling apart. That to me has to come down to the coaching and, and how like how everything is managed uh, with that. But Jordan Thompson just she just lacks, year. she just lacks that that finishing power that that she has everything but that like final two inches of decisiveness of of something different. Whereas, like, we see all these other elite right sides who will take, you know, they'll take risks and they'll be aggressive, whereas Jordan Thompson just isn't. Um, she's, very, she's very much a systematic player. She fits well within the American system, but ultimately, like, hell, we even saw the Americans get bullied a little bit by the Dominican Republic at the, at the North Seca Championships. So there's a big question mark for me in, in, with, with Jordan Thompson. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, I do not have good vibes about the American women right now. I don't. I, I I'm not uh, not super optimistic about their summer, and that sucks because they're the defending Olympic gold medalists. But uh, I am not optimistic about their summer. It was good to see Ali Franti come off the bench and produce on offense this game. Uh, mm-hmm. Her her reception was was horrible, horrible. But um, Gadetti had to make some kind of change after uh, after set one going the way it did, and he put Franti in. At least she went twelve for twenty three on offense, so that that was good to see. But uh, to me, it comes down to Idzajabasha has one of those four great opposites in the world, and Vakif Bank doesn't anymore. They had Paulegonu last year. 
Uh, Jordan Thompson is, is a substantial step down, even though they have Gabby Guimaraes, who is incredible. Uh, it's not enough. She she can't she can't put a team on her back offensively the way that Tiana Boscovic can, or the no. way that Melissa Vargas can, or hell, you know, she can't even she can't even put a, her team on her back offensively like Kira Van Wright can. You know, like, well, yeah, if, they, if Kira not, Van Wright if Kira Van Wright was playing for this Vakov Bank team, things might be a little bit different. Yeah, you're not wrong. Uh, Kira in this one getting three donged by Fenerbahce. Uh, Kira dropped 21. Next highest score was nine. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, like, they just, like, like uh, Soy uh, Nierman is, like, almost 40 years old. Yeah, she's up there. And she Julia, Julia Bergman's been real bad. Zero real percent bad. Efficiency. So, yeah, they just don't have the firepower. They have Kira and no one else. Yeah, absolutely no one else. Um, yeah, so like this mean, this series is not competitive. Plus, it's 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 only best of three games in the semis yeah. in Turkey. So like this is over. Like Fener, yeah, yeah no. not close. Like Fenerbahce is going to win, and that that's how that's how important this last game of the regular season was to give Fenerbahce the one seed is because they they get the significantly easier semifinal. And yeah. Zaja Basha at least has to work a little bit harder to beat Vakif Bank. They did now. They did do it at home this time because uh, Zaja Basha fell all the way to the three seed after mm-hmm. losing to Fenner on Wednesday. So now actually matches two and if necessary match three are both at Vakif Bank's home gym, which is an interesting Ooh. way that they do the format in Turkey. The the higher I don't mind seed, that. yeah, I kind of like it too. The higher seeded team gets matches two and three. All right. Okay, well, we'll we'll have to see when do match when does game two of these playoffs go down? Um, games game ones were today. Looks like Thursday. Friday? The fourth uh, Thursday. Fourth Thursday. Thursday. Uh, nice times too. At uh, ten a.m. and one p.m. Eastern. That's nice. I'm, uh, I can no, get... I'll I'll be working, so I'll, I won't be able to watch them. I can get with that. All right. Uh, we got to spend some time, Everett. Oh, we yeah. Spend some time on the post. Let's, let's, let's go. go. Let's, 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 let's break this down because, oh, my goodness, Rob, shit has been happening. There's, there's so yeah. many races. There's so many races to talk about. First and foremost, I have to ask you, is this the updated stats as of this afternoon? It is updated as, as of this morning. So the only game that okay, is not no. reflected on here is Kuprum Lubin, 3 Dong and Katowice, which does which, change a lot at the bottom, but it doesn't change anything at the top. Okay, so let's let's break this down. First and foremost, you have the race at the top, which is a little straightforward. JW, Zavierci, Vershava, they all have a shot, right? I would guess based off of the matchups that are upcoming, I would bet that that would almost stay the same, right? I agree. JSW did just lose to Xavier Che the other day, but JSW yes. chose to like load manage and they rested both Huber and Glotter and Xavier Che yes. be- Xavier Che beat him three to one. But uh, yeah, I, I still JSW still definitely has the inside track to first. Yeah, they, they, they still have the, the inside track to first. Uh, JSW has to play Scraw, and they have to play Zaxa. Zavici has to play Zaxa, uh, and they have to play um, Nissa. Um, okay, and this is an interesting team. They're, they're a real interesting <laughs> team. It, Nissa just reverse-swept Vershava, which was crazy. After Vershava yeah. reverse swept Zaxa, then they turn around and get reverse swept by Nissa. And this is hot. They're in seventh. Yeah. So Miss Nissa is hot. They are in seventh. They need one win just to just to Nis just to clinch. Uh, they have Suvalki and Zav- Zavierci coming up. What the big thing that happened this weekend, Rob, was that Zaxa lost to Suvalki. Three four. Yes. Yeah. So they didn't get any points for that. And they still they there was a, a minute in time there where they were about to beat Vorsava and they would have been at 40 41 points because they were sitting at, at 38 eight at the time. Since then they lost to Vorsava in five and then lost to Suvalki. They need to beat Zavierci and JSW to have a shot to make it in my top opinion. two teams in the league and Wait, I I agree with you. That's what they must do. I don't see it, man. I don't see it mostly because if there's two teams who the two team who choose to like have the most most to lose by facing Zach potentially in the playoffs is JW and Zavierci. That's the last thing 
the last thing because if Zach is able to somehow make it into the playoffs, God help everyone, <laughs> right? God, God help everyone. Like I, I know they'll figure it out. So it would be the scariest ex- eight seed in playoff history, even scarier than Milano last year to Perugia. But hundred percent, like I mean, we've said this was- year. I will never count Zaxa out until no. they are mathematically eliminated. No. But this is definitely stacked against them, and you nailed it. Xavier Che and JSW, their last two opponents, are the most motivated to make sure Zaxa doesn't get in. 100%. And ben, Kaczmarek it, but, and Schlievka, both horrendous against Shuvalki, by the way. Both terrible, both matched. Yeah. I didn't watch the match. I meant to and accidentally had a nap. Uh, my bad. <laughs> I got... I got randomly so drunk on Thursday night for no reason to like, <laughs> and like in, in a weird way, Friday was, was a write off. It wasn't a fun day. Um, but when you look at that playoff race for the last spots in the playoffs and you have to go down Nissa sitting in seventh, they have 42 points. They're pretty much safe. In my opinion, if they get like one point, they'll be fine. But if they get one win, they'll fully, fully have clinched seventh. They're nine points behind Gdansk. They're not catching them. Olshtin uh, is the next team. Obviously, they're they're sitting in eight. They have to play Vorshava and Suvalki, right? So that is a is a tough uh, matchup, but still, there's stuff to play Suvalki. If they can do what Zaxa didn't and get that win, they will also be safe. Dude, Olshtin is a crazy team. They have three less wins than the teams above and below them. They've really? lo- they've lost so many five setters this year. They're, look at that. Nissa and Skra are both 14 and 14. Olsten is 11 and 17, and they still have 40 points. They've lost so many five. So is wins the first level in the tiebreaker? No, it's it's points. Points are first, then wins. Okay, so it goes points and then win. But that in the in this in in the case of a tiebreaker, that could be huge. That hurts Um, Olsten badly if they get tied or passed in points. Yeah. Sitting in ninth right now is Scraw. And now Scraw is another interesting one because they have JW and Lviv coming up. And mm. if I can jump over Zaxa and just talk about Lviv, Lviv, in my opinion, actually low key has a really good, not a really good shot. But if Olsen goes 0 2, Lviv has Radon, which is essentially like a, an open win for them. And if they're able to get a three dong, then they have Scraw in their the palm of their hand. Right? And that match and might be to make the playoffs. That match, that match, that Scraw versus Lviv match uh, to, to finish up the year could have so many in playoff implica- implications, which is r- really outstanding. Um, but Zaxa, the fact that they need to play Zavierci and Date JW. And you need to absolutely beat one of them. Like if if you lose one game, you're abs- you're done. You're done. Yeah, you're done. You're done. Yeah, for sure. You're done, right? But like, this it's is so as, crazy. This is it's good crazy. Of a race. It's it's crazy because if you look at just like the next game, like Nissa plays Suvalki, so I'm I'm like seeing Nissa as like they've got one foot into the playoffs. I in, agree. In my mind, right? Sh- Suvalki did. Both. Suvalki just beats Oxa, but Suvalki has nothing to play for. They're yeah. like they're. Right. Ten points but, out of eleventh, and they and they're obviously safe from relegation. Yeah. Like they, there's nothing in it for them. Yeah. Whereas I could see Olsen, Scraw, and Zaxa all losing for Shava, JW, Zavichi. They have to they have to play the three best teams in, in in the league right now. So I see all of those teams losing, losing, and I see Lviv beating Redome. I so agree. By the the final game of the season, Lviv could be in in eight. Because they'd be that would tied be, with Olsen on would points, but they would they would they would have more wins, and then would have to play Bel- Scra. Dude, this this, which, this is case, like if Lviv goes two and zero, oh, they they qualify. They're so. in, yeah, yeah, they're in. If they, if they get six points, and like you said, they have by far the easiest road. Uh, this this is going to be as good of a playoff race in volleyball as I may have ever seen. <laughs> and the the best the best thing is like the. The, the match day 29, which is the second to last one, it, it started today with uh, Cooper and Lubin beating Katowice 3 0. So that's not which, reflected in what you're seeing here. All that did was guarantee that Cooper is safe. So Cooper yeah. is safe from relegation. Charney Rodham needs to go 2 0 with six points, and they need Norvid to lose both matches and get zero points. That's the only way that Charney Rodham does not get relegated. So, and, and they play Lviv um, on 
at Wednesday, and, then, and Lviv is extremely motivated. On Thursday, sorry, and Lviv is extremely motivated. So, Radom, you're in big, big trouble, which is a bummer, but because they've been much better the second half of the season, but their first half was so bad, so bad that it looks like they're done. But yeah, the Tuesday, so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday is that round 29. Then Saturday, Sunday, Monday is round 30. And those games are going to decide it all. And it actually starts Saturday, like first thing in the morning, North America time with JSW versus Zaxa. <laughs> and then like it only gets more interesting from there. Like Nissa versus Xavier Chick could be really interesting. The only one that's kind of not is Rosovia versus Gdansk. Because I mean, those two teams are good, but they're basically like locked in where they're at. Uh, Skra versus Barcom Lviv very well could but- be for a playoff spot. No, but I think Rosovia versus Gdansk will be spicy too because that could like if you're Rosovia, do you want to play Gdansk or do you want to play Lublin? Like, do you do you want to have have a home court advantage in the first round? Like, like there's there's the reason like, why I say it is because Lublin has Katowice and Lublin's mm. gonna and Lublin's gonna win. Yeah, and, and but Lublin can't catch Rosovia, so like there's. A solid chance that that match isn't going to matter. However, Rosovia probably wants revenge on Lublin because they lost to him in the Polish Cup quarterfinal. True. So I, I kind of like that series if it does happen. But yeah, that um, Nissa Zavierce is massive. Skra versus Barcom Lviv, depending on what happens like this week, could be literally for a playoff spot. And then Zaxa, first thing in the morning on Saturday, has to go and try and beat JSW. The question is, like, what does JSW throw at him? And because they just rested Huber and Glotter. And lost to Xavier Che. Who does you have this? this I think. Draw? I think. I think this game is more important than that game. I agree. I agree. Right. Uh, I think that this game is 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 more important than that game. And I mean, they did rest the middles. Patry played terribly. Yeah, they brought bad. in Slater, Slater, and and he was much better. But still, like Xavier Che, Xavier Che was all over the place on defense. I saw Adnos post that they, that they had twenty five digs in the first two sets of that match alone. Whoa, like, which, which is phenomenal. Perry had eight in two. God, he's two, so good. Uh, yeah. And it really shows kind of how the dynamic changes when you take out the two middles um, for JW. Like, that, that's huge. Once again, we've talked about it. Huber has been statistically the best middle on the planet this club season. It's it's not even been close. Um, Kyra Butrin, by the way, 24 on uh, 47% oh, yeah. efficiency. He had nine good. digs and four aces. Very nice. Okay. All right, then. Um, the last race to talk about in all of this is the relegation race. Um, now, we mentioned it, it is a little different than you see on the screen here, but um, Katowice was in last place, or was, was, was in that race. They got a win earlier this week. Who did they beat earlier this week again? They beat they, they, Barcom Lviv. <laughs> yeah, they beat yeah. Lviv. Three, beat two, him in, which, right. Beat him <laughs> if if that game had gone the opposite direction, things would have been crazier, because Katowice would have been down there with with Lubin and and Radom, and Lviv would have been would have been back up up with with the rest of them. I digress. So, um, yeah, Katowice is Katowice is safe. I'm almost positive. Uh, even if they go zero and two down the stretch, they'd have a better set ratio than. Um, than Rodham if if Rodham goes two and zero like the, I think the only chance that Rodham has if I did the math correctly and somebody correct yeah. me if I'm wrong about this but Rodham has to go two and zero with six points and Norvid has to go zero and two well actually yeah. yeah the 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 points do matter because like if if Rodham ties them up at twenty four points and Norvid goes zero and two then Rodham would have eight match wins and Norvid only seven so like that that's no that's the only path there Norvid is playing like a dance in Vorstava. Tough, dude. That's tough. So that's tough. Norvid going 0-6 is not out of this world. Definitely it's not. Just, it's just on the other side with Radom playing Lviv and Kuprum. Like, I don't see them getting three dong, a three dong on Lviv, especially with what's on the line right now for, for that Lviv team. And imagine imagine how big it would be for that team to make the playoffs. Oh, like, for a Ukrainian team to make the Plus League playoffs. Yeah, it would be unbelievable. Yeah. Would be at, would would be absolutely massive, um, and then Kuprum, like I think for Lubin, they want to make sure that like like I know they're not being relegated, but they wouldn't want to lose the like. There's just yeah, there's just way. That's not a good way to end the season if you're no, losing a team who 
is getting relegated. However, uh, Poland also does this stupid placement playoffs from spots nine through 14. And it, okay. if, if I were them, I would kind of, if I were like a lower ranked team, I would want to finish in 15th exactly because you don't get relegated, but also your season's over. Like that's what Toronto did in Italy. They, they finished second to last, I'm pretty sure. And yeah. they don't have to play this dumb three week oh, like, garbage. You know? So they're done. Like Jeff Jendrick and like, and Kyle Russell, like they're home. Like they're done. Is if like, cause Zaxa not making the playoffs here is a massive potential. Like, Potential. It's very possible. Like it is, I would say it's more probable than possible. Just because of right? the teams they have to play. Yeah, because I agree. The teams, I agree. The, not only the teams that they have to play, but how they've been playing, how inconsistent that they've been. They just haven't been able to, to to grasp it. I almost think at this point, that's best case scenario for the athletes. Agreed. I agree. Right? I agree. And if you're the Polish national team and the American national team, if you're the Polish national team, if if you're Poland, what you do is you let all of the Polish national team players go on leave and you force Smith and uh and Soji to play out your contract. That's uh, that's what, like if you were if you were a dick about it and like I know I know Zaxa isn't that type of club, but like that's what you would do, right? Like you guys can go off like Janusz and Slivka and, and Bednors. Um you guys can go off and get some rest. Get ready for VNL. Get ready for the Olympics. We believe in you. No, Shoji Smith, back to work. God, I hope he'll get us guys, that ninth place. God, I hope that I hope that those guys get to leave. I desperately but, hope for but Smith I, and Shoji's sake. They, those guys. They, it's been such a hard season. They they deserve to go home. They yeah. really do. And I think it would be massive for the American team to have a, a revitalized David Smith and Eric Shoji leading into VNL and the Olympics. We're gonna need them. Yeah. Gonna need them for Paris. That's for damn sure. Yeah. Um, all right. All gonna right. be real spicy this week. Make sure you get in the Discord. Make very, very sure you get in the Discord for this week of Poland because there's games every day except for Friday. They're they're off on Friday, but there's games every day between now and next Monday. And uh, by the next show that we do, we're going to know the playoffs and we're going to have this whole race behind us. So it's, it's going to be sick and you're going to want to be in there talking about it and we'll help you find ways to watch it. So uh, definitely use the Volleyball Source Discord as a resource. Streams. The link is in the description. Top. Yeah, that's, that's, where, that's where I'll watch all my Plus Liga. Yeah, me too. It's, it's, it's fantastic. It um, speaking of playoffs, that. the Bundesliga. Uh, the Bundesliga semifinals. Uh, I haven't watched yeah. much. It's uh, hard but- to watch. You have to pay now. I know it's a also big shout out to Jackson Young there. Blah, blah. Look, he's looking good. He's he looking, looking good. very Canadian with the stash. Yeah, Geeson and Friedrichshafen are tied one to one. Geeson pulled up a sick five set win in in the first game of the semifinal. And I just I feel like I feel bad for Lundberg, but at the same time I don't. They're they're down o two to Berlin. I was I was looking at the head to head history. Uh, other than one regular season match where. Lundberg beat Berlin, I think, back in like October of this year. Oh, mm-hmm. Let's see. Uh, yeah, it's it's been a while. Uh, uh, November of no, actually, sorry, February of last year was the last time that Lundberg beat Berlin, and and it was in regular season play. Other than that, Berlin is like twenty and one in their last that many games against Lundberg. And Lundberg has had so many chances and f- they've had 2-0 leads. They've had they've had fifth sets. They've had so many chances to beat Berlin and they just can't do it. They it's, just can't do it. It does very much feel like the little brother going after like the big brother. And that the big brother is going to kind of let them get their licks once in a while. But ultimately, it's still the vibe of the big brother holding his arm out. And the little brother still is in like, let me at him. Let me at him. Like, let me get him. Like, that's, that's kind of what it feels like when you watch Lundberg versus, versus Berlin. Yeah, I just um, counted post-COVID. <laughs> post-COVID, Berlin versus Lundberg. Berlin is 15-1. and one. Wow. And obviously Berlin has dominated the Bundesliga generally, but uh, it just has seemed particular to me that Lundberg just cannot get over the hump uh, against Berlin, and I don't expect them to. Uh, that th- Those next couple semifinal games are Wednesday, and it's a bummer. Yeah, it, it, it is a bummer. I wish I could watch it too. I really liked watching the, the Bundesliga last year when everything was on Bounce House, uh, and so far in the playoffs, they haven't had any of their Friday 
um, matches. Uh, in the other semifinal, though, where it is a little bit interesting, um, Geeson actually took match number one, three, two, went 19, 17, Rob, oh, yeah. um, in the fifth, uh, absolutely real, uh, M Michel Ahi, Ahi, A-H-Y-Y-I, um, dropped 26, wow, that's a heck of a uh, name. in this one for Ge Geeson, 22 and 34 with two blocks and two aces. Um, he's out of the Netherlands, so he's another... Uh, he's a 98, so he's a little bit younger uh, than, than some of those other guys, but still uh, looking pretty good. Also, also, of course, I have to, have to give a shout out to my boy, Jory Mantha, going 14 for 26 um, in this one for wow. Geeson. Is he in, playing in left side? One. Yeah, he is. He is playing left side. And then also, too, um, even more so, you got more Canadian content. I'm just going to roll, roll with this, but Jackson Young, the man right there, out of Nipissing University up in North Bay, um he got taken off but he was nine for 15 um in 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 this one in in the or in the uh the that loss respect good for yeah. uh good for some canadians over there um yeah that that's the bundesliga we'll we'll, we'll see who berlin plays in the finals because unfortunately i think that semifinal series is over also the french league they played their first couple just only the first round of semi of quarterfinals and i didn't really see anything interesting so uh, we'll keep an eye on that. I also didn't really see anything in the PVF, Everett. They had a lighter week, and I didn't really watch very much. I am watching currently in this game. Uh, Atlanta is up 2-1 on Grand Rapids. So those are the two of the best teams in the PVF going toe-to-toe -to -toe right now. Um, Atlanta was up 2-1. Grand Rapids came back, won the, won the third. They are currently playing at home, and it's 6-4 Atlanta in the fourth. Okay. So Ooh, I, Atlanta, Atlanta yeah. won the second, twenty five ten. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. I'm like, you no, know, I'm working nights again, so it's harder for me to watch PVF all of a sudden. You know, it was great when I was unemployed and I could just watch PVF every night. It was fantastic. And I, <laughs> well, that, that um, was me last year. It was great being unemployed. We can do the show at European friendly times. So yeah, not anymore. <laughs> yeah. No. Not. Not. Not exactly. Um. So yeah, definitely. I'm gonna wa continue watching this game. Uh, because I yeah, I'll turn it on right. I'll turn it on right after this. Uh, um, last but not least, we got. Um, I'm heading out to the East Coast this weekend for VLA. We're going to be in Albany, New York. Um, okay. Good tournament. It's only nine teams, but I, I, I actually like this format a lot. Um, team LVC has a lot on the line. They're playing at home. They are the best team in Tier One. They are the best team really in the entire VLA. They won this tournament last year. Uh, they kind of have to put tier the, the tier one level on their back this weekend because uh tier two teams have won the first two tournaments this year but uh keep an eye out for that team uh seed three and pool b eighth overall brand new team the dc dynasty i was gonna say that's the one logo rob it that doesn't I have a word mark on it yeah but i like it it's a good logo yeah they, it's they, a good logo not many teams with that colorway out there and just in the world in general and, and i kind of like that yeah, we've got a lot of good, a lot of good branding in the VLA. A lot of teams with good looking logos, good looking uniforms. But yeah, good the start. DC Dynasty are, are are like a brand new team this season. But they've basically won everything they've played up to this point. Oh, so that they won. Uh, there was a qualifier tournament to get into this event, which they won. Uh, they've won a bunch of exhibitions. They, they've like kind of killed everyone they've touched, but they haven't played at a level like this yet. So I'm excited to see them play Boston. They play Boston bounce like first thing Saturday morning and Boston's good. So um, that'll be Ooh. like that'll be a good litmus test. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll uh, I'll be in Albany. I'll be doing the NFL red zone style whip around broadcast, uh, which will be really fun. So, yeah, give this a look. I think Sunday's finals. Who I, it, I would be stunned if Team LVC didn't go to the final. I don't think they're going to get touched. But um, if the if the DC Dynasty won that pool, won Pool B, and like played LVC in the final, I wouldn't be that surprised. And that match would be sick. Are they are they calling themselves? I'm all over their Instagram right now. Yeah. By the way, they they've got I like the pink. Are they calling themselves the Cherry Blossom? Yeah, that's that's that pink flower. That's the, sick. That, that, so that, they're that the DC Dynasty got, Cherry Blossoms. Maybe I like that. I like that a lot. So. Oh yeah, they've and they they've I'm I'm seeing here like they've been they've been beating up on oh, the VLA team. Yeah, they've killed everyone they've played, but they haven't played at a like a major like full point value VLA event yet. So we'll see how they do. How is how is the the volleyball in that like DC, Maryland, Virginia area? 
I don't know. Uh, well, the River City Flow are from Richmond, and they won the Central Cup a few weeks ago. Okay, so like, yeah. Rich, Richmond's got talent for sure, and then Maryland definitely has talent. Like Aaron Russell's from Maryland. Uh, like him where's, his, where's where's the River City Flow for this one? I don't. I'm actually really surprised they're not playing this event. Uh, they I guess they threw all their eggs at the Cincinnati tournament that they went out and won, and just are like taking this weekend off. I know the guy that runs their team coaches NCAA men's, and he's probably super booked up but uh yeah not having them in the picture is is um definitely opens up some things for a team like the dynasty who i just kind of don't really know that much about i know one kid who plays for him that lived in chicago and then moved out there but uh okay. i think we're gonna learn a lot about the, the like northern virginia maryland area and like what kind of talent they've got because they've put in this team and, the, and everyone kind of around the league has been like whispering like yo what, what's what's the deal with this dc dynasty team because nobody's really seen him yet so uh we'll see how they how they look on the big stage it'll be fun all right sick love to see uh love to see another team get in there in the vla another tier two team who's gonna upset a tier one team love it <laughs> oh everett oh everett um yeah it's it, and this will be the last our last event before the vla cup too so we've got like a month and a half after this for uh the biggest tournament in league history, which is going to be sick, and uh, I'm I'm certainly looking forward to. Yeah, we're going to miss VNL for it. So that's uh, that's championships. That's later. Oh, uh, that's championships. Okay, that's 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 the playoff event. VLA Cup. Let's see. I can't remember what the latest number is. I think we have how many teams do we have? Uh, at least forty. At Where's least going down. Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, there's a, a brand new actually you'll like this a brand new facility in madison that was like owned by league one it's owned by lovb and then like one of the clubs that they bought is this club in madison that that plays there and uh they have a good relationship with the vla because there's a there's a vla team men's and women's in madison so yeah we're nice. hosting it there i think they've got like eight maybe even ten courts and they have a liquor license which is insane so everyone's going to be um, enjoying some beverages and their off games it'll be a good vibe it's it's going to be a great event and it'll be massive so Ooh. that's coming up uh like mid mid may i think like may 18th ish it's two weekends after men's ncaa finals okay sorry i've just watched uh, uh grand rapids go on a nice little run tie things up and now they're up 13 11 with some blocking and some serving so uh awesome that, that's speaking that's nice of map. uh Speaking of just things going on in the U.S., uh, I, I just I mentioned men's NCAA a little bit ago. I'm starting to dive into this a lot more as we approach like conference championship season. It's going to be one of the most competitive and probably contentious at large bid situations ever. Ooh, because there the, there's a new format this year for men's NCAA. It's eight teams, and there's six automatic bids from six conferences now get automatic bids, which is insane. Just a couple of years ago, it was just three. But that means there's only two at-large spots. But the thing is that the at least the five or maybe even the six best teams in the country are all from the West Coast, and they're all from two conferences only. So there will be West at the least MPSF. the MPSF in the Big West. Yeah, so it's Hawaii in no particular order, Hawaii, Long Beach, and Irvine out of the Big West, and Grand Canyon, UCLA, and BYU out of the MPSF. Of those six teams, two of them are not going to make the NCAA tournament. And, wow. And that's going to be really, really crazy. So uh, we've got about a month until men's NCAAs, and I'm starting to dive into it for reasons that will be announced a little bit later. But uh, we're going to start covering it a little bit more, uh, at least especially when the conference champ when the conference tournaments come yeah. around. And then sure. the other thing, Everett, is uh, I, I heard through the grapevine a rumor about the next CEO of USA Volleyball. And the, the only the only detail that I heard that I can share is that the, it, the next CEO of USA Volleyball will be someone with a strong background and a strong passion for the men's game. Okay, so you're going to tell me once we sign off here. Maybe. No, not maybe. Don't give me any of that bullshit. Well, the, that's, when that, I hear T, I tell you T. That's what the, the latest thing that I heard that we can say on the show is that the next CEO of USA Volleyball will be somebody with uh, – and with focus and emphasis on the men's game, which excites me. Okay. Depending Very on who it is. Depending, depending on who, you know who it is. I, I actually don't know who it is. I'll, I'll tell you more right after this. I do not know who it is, but uh, it's going to be an interesting year. All right. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Um, check out Italian League semis on Wednesday and women's quarters on Wednesday. Uh, Liga. 
yeah, Sutton La Ligi semis are going down Thursday, Plus Liga all week long. And we will see you later. Yep. Get, get in the Discord. Uh, we'll figure out when next week's show is going to be. It will depend on Purdue basketball on Saturday night. Uh, yeah, watch VLA over the weekend. I'll be there in New York. And uh, we'll see y'all soon. We love you very much. Thanks for watching. Right.